Welcome to the Pope on Film. I'm Bunny Williams, and with me is... Uh, Reverend Steve, the founder of the Church of Ed Wood, which is at edwood.org, as long as we paid the bill, so you should go check that out. Excellent. Excellent. So I found the GoPro on Craigslist for 150 bucks. So I got to go meet that guy today. I once feels. Hmm? I once got a, a got a washer and dryer for like twenty bucks. I got that on Craigslist and I brought it home and I it washed everything fine. And then when I went to dry it, it the dryer caught on fire. <laughs> really? Yeah. It was just 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 automatically started smoking and flames and we had to put it out. The washing machine I actually still have and it's probably been like about a decade that I've had that. But that dryer, I, I don't have a dryer because the dryer will burst into flames. <laughs> so since then I've been a little bit leery about it. I got my 20 bucks back. So that's yeah. good. I got my 20 bucks back. But still, I'm to this day a bit leery and hesitant when it comes to the Craigslist. Uh, I, I haven't done it much. I, I am both like kind of repulsed and excited by the strange clandestine meetings. Yeah. That a Craigslist, Craigslist exchange. So this is, this is meet me at five in the Safeway parking lot. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's 150 bucks. I'll, I'll, I'll meet him in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a damn good price. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I bought crack in in less uncomfortable places. <laughs> <laughs> well, this GoPro situation is gonna throw a wrench on this episode because I I could talk about today's movies for a couple of days. Well, we've got that in an hour and a half, so we're good. Well, I mean, so um, so that means that that's when we're going to have to reel it in. You're still going to have to reel it in? Yeah, I'm <laughs> still going to have to reel it in. Oh, I'm still going to have to reel it in. All right. Go for it. Jump. Let's just jump, jump right in then. Uh, well, then. Uh, I will talk to you of art, for there is nothing else to talk about, for there is nothing else. Life is an obscure hobo bumming a ride on the omnibus of art. I memorized it when I was in high school. I memorized that opening poem. I have most of it. Still memorized. Uh, burn gas buggies and whip your sour cream of circumstance. The artist is. All others are not. What is not art is graham crackers. <laughs> That's just off the top of my head. Because I, yeah. I love 1959's A Bucket of Blood so much. And it's surprising how much I love it because I'm not the biggest fan of director Roger Corman. Right. I feel like he gets a lot of credit for the volume of his work and not necessarily not necessarily the quality of his work. The quality like, of Corman's work is usually pretty fucking bad. Um and, and he's got a couple of good movies which I would boil down to this and Little Shop of Horrors. And that's about it, you know? Yeah. But out of out of over 500 movies, you know, the odds are good that you're going to make something good sooner or later. Yeah. You know, but I, I have a lot of respect for the man, not so much for his filmmaking, but for his, basically his business acumen that he has kept in the business. Cranking out crap. He made, he made a bucket of blood for $50,000 in five days. It took him five days to make this movie. And it's absolutely surprising to me because this movie is just 
a perfect, perfect little film. I absolutely yeah. love this movie. It's not really a horror movie, and it's not really a comedy. There aren't too many laugh-out-loud parts of this film. It, maybe a dark comedy, but I don't like saying that because it just seems weird. I, I never yeah. liked the term dark comedy the, before. The comedy comes more from the situation and the characters in it. Yeah. You know, the the whole beatnik culture and the artsy-fartsy pretentiousness of them. Yeah, I read in some magazine maybe a decade or two ago, and I don't remember which ma- – it was some monster magazine, but they said that a, a bucket of blood is one of the only films – to perfectly talk about and discuss and disseminate beatnik culture and the artistic culture of the 1950s while in the 1950s. Uh They went on to say that there were a lot of movies that tried to capture that period in time and the poetry and the art and the, the, the bohemian aspect of that period in time but most of those films were in the 1960s and 1970s, and that this film actually captured that in the moment, and so it should be revered as this wonderful film. And I, that, that, might, that might have been one of the reasons why I first saw this movie. Other than the fact that it stars Dick Miller, and I love that man. Mm-hmm. I, love, I love Dick Miller. I oh. love this man. He's still alive. I had to look. I had to look that up to see if he was still alive. He's still alive. He's eighty-five years old. He is still doing some uh, some um, convention circuits. He, he pops up really? conventions from time to time. Yeah. Oh, well, that's so, wonderful. He what? He's been in so many films. I IMDb his credits. He was in over a hundred films. He was in Terminator. He was in Gremlins. He was in Star, a couple episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation. He was in a, a – and then sometime around the 70s or 80s, Joe Dante, the director, just decided that, that he was going to put Dick Miller in everything. Right. Like uh, yeah. like Disney Pixar films always has Cliff Clavin from Cheers. So Joe Dante put him in The Howling and Explorers and The Burbs and Matinee and that horrible Looney Tunes movie that he made. Looney yeah. Tunes back in action. I watch a lot of kids' movies. <laughs> That's an interesting film because uh, it, Robbie the Robot's in it. Oh, really? Yeah, there's this bizarre science fiction montage where, like, Daffy Duck and Bugs Bunny are running through some museum and they go into this sci-fi area and there's, like, a... a the what's the name of the robot from the day the earth stood still? Gort. Yeah. He, I believe he's in there and Robbie the Robot and a bunch of others. But it's an interesting film. In Howling he is he is he plays Walter Paisley in that film. He plays Walter Paisley in a lot of films. Yeah. And apparently he was supposed to because he because Roger Corman followed up a bucket of blood with Little Shop of Horrors. And I like Little Shop of Horrors, but I, I I, also kind of hate it. And I think the reason why I've hated it for so long, I've, I've tried to embrace it recently, but for the longest time I hated Little Shop of Horrors. And I think that's because he did a bucket of blood, and then he immediately did Little Shop of Horrors, and then Little Shop of Horrors, became this huge, massive thing that people love and a musical and people still talk about and this wonderful film and Jack Nicholson. But I feel that A Bucket of Blood deserves that same amount of praise and love and attention, if not more so. And I recently learned that there's a musical that they made of A Bucket of Blood, although I can't imagine what that would be like and if it would be as wonderful as the musical Little Shop of Horrors. But... (laughs) I'm, I'm really getting so jealous. tired of the. I'm getting tired of the whole musical thing. They're making musicals out of fucking everything, and it's just, you know. There's Evil Dead the musical. 
there's the Shining, the musical now they're about to release. Uh, and there's a the Planet from Outer Space musical that I was going to do at one point in time, but it, like someone wanted me to go to L.A. and do the play there, but um, I think they're like backing fell through or something like that. Something very Ed Wood ish. But apparently there's a musical and it's supposed to be pretty good. Huh. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I Bucket of Blood. Probably heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the movie Bucket of Blood was written by Charles B. Griffiths, and I looked him up, and he also wrote Little Shop of Horrors, and he also wrote, which I think is a wonderful fucking film, Death Race 2000. Oh, yes. With fucking bare butt Sylvester Stallone and running over people, and it's, and it's just such a wonderful movie. <laughs> Love that yeah. movie. It's a perfect okay. little exploitation film. A the Bucket of Blood... Frankenstein. Yeah. Yeah. A Bucket of Blood was Roger Corman's first attempt at a comedy, and then the second one was Little Shop of Horrors. Little Shop of Horrors was apparently supposed to star Dick Miller, and he was going to play the Walter Paisley character in the film. And then Roger Corman had plans to just put Walter Paisley in a bunch of different films. But Dick Miller kind of said no, and he's in Little Shop of Horrors. I think his character is just customer or something like that, but he is in it. But when uh, you I see him... Re- still unofficially Walter Paisley. And if I'm not mistaken, I think they did uh, Little Shop of Horrors and Bucket of Blood back to back. Yeah, I believe so, too. A lot of the same people pop up in, really, in all of Roger Corman's films, but I believe you are correct in that. If you look at the main character in Little Shop of Horrors, it is very Walter Paisley-esque. Walter, yeah. Walter paisley I I fell in love with this movie. Uh, Dick Miller playing Walter Paisley as the, just this, lovable guy who wants to fit in and inadvertently becomes a serial killer. Mm-hmm. Through in, in what seems to be accidental. Yeah. I mean, you're kind of rooting for him in this film. Yeah. He definitely has some mental issues, though, you know, that to, to go so far for the acceptance of these douchebags. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And that's pretty much what he's feeling. It's it's just for for their acceptance. Yeah. <sighs> I remember and you he, could probably cause... drop Walter Paisley into any other group. You know. Yeah. And he would he would act the same way. Yeah. Yeah. That's. He just wants to fit in so bad. Yeah. And I really feel for him, the poor schmuck. I think that would be a good oh, description here's, of here's, him. Here, here's one that'll get you, okay? If we were to drop him into the wrestling world, <laughs> he he would become Hurricane. Oh, yeah, that'd be really good. <laughs> God, the Hurricane. I miss the Hurricane. That was just, God, I love him. Yeah, he was amazing. Or, or like a, like a, like I was also thinking of maybe Eugene. Eugene, I, I missed the Eugene. Eugene. There's like a little of it. That's that's sort of when I started fading out on wrestling a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was pretty horrible. So I learned sometime around 2000 or 2001 that in 1995 the network Showtime made a a uh, a Showtime late night ver- remake of a bucket of blood, and they called it a bucket of blood. When they it was when they released it on DVD that they decided to change the name to something that would be more exciting, and then that oh. DVD, and then that DVD quickly went out of print. But I I I spent. I have spent about 10, 
12, 14 years, somewhere around there, looking for the remake. And it, it, it was so hard to find. I couldn't find it anywhere. It wasn't anywhere online. I finally had to, like, download a copy from, like, file uploader from this guy who knew this person who had a copy on his computer in Germany and sent it to me, sent it to the friend, and the friend put it on file uploader, and then I downloaded it from him, and it, it was this whole big, massive thing to try and get this movie. But once I did, I automatically put it on YouTube, and it has stayed there despite the full frontal nudity in the film. Uh-huh. And Which I'm, was definitely a nice upgrade. Yes, and when you see the nudity in the film and you, and you hear that this is a Showtime movie, then that just kind of makes sense. Yeah. Because it says Showtime and also 90s Showtime. It's not like now Showtime making all of these serious dramas and everything like all these cable stations. No, this is nice. This is Red Shoot Diaries Showtime mm-hmm. that we're talking about here. And I found out something interesting when I was watching the movie. I saw that it was directed by Michael James McDonald, and I'm like, that, that, that's a name somehow. I don't, I have no idea who it is, but that's some sort of a name. So I looked him up. Did you ever see Mad TV? Uh, sometimes, yeah. Well, it, Michael James McDonald was the longest cast member on the show, and he played his reoccurring character was Stuart, this annoying ass little kid. I remember him well. Yeah, he was very annoying. <laughs> yeah. He's the guy who directed this movie. Seriously. Yeah, and oh, apparently he, he was also yeah, he, apparently he was also a producer on Cougar Town and he had small parts in all the Austin Powers movies. I, he's one of those guys where I say Michael James McDonald and everybody has no idea, but once you see his face yeah. Then you're like, oh yeah, that guy. Mm-hmm. But I had such a hard time uh, coming to terms with the fact that Stuart from Mad TV directed the remake of A Bucket of Blood. <laughs> but that also kind of makes sense because there are some really good people in this movie. Yeah. And, like, and uh, Paul Bartell. And what? Paul Bartell. Uh, he was, he wasn't through the whole movie, he was early on. Uh, Paul Bartell is, has worked with Corman a lot, and he is actually the one who directed Death Race. Oh, yeah? And a fuckload of other things. He, he's sort of, he's sort of a Hollywood guy, almost like a mascot, you know, where he's yeah. done a lot on his own. Eating Raul. Have you ever heard of Eating Raul? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, him and his wife, uh, I, God, I forget her name. I always get her, get her name confused with the, uh, female serial killer. Because <laughs> huh. it's something like Elaine Warnos or something like that. You know? Uh, but yeah, he, he, his face was popping up there. And there's just something about that dude. He, whenever I see him on film, he just makes me happy. <laughs> I don't know why. Well, I'm gonna have to like. Great. I'm gonna have to look him up and look for him now because that's awesome. You will know him, you know. If you start looking for him, you, you'll just be like, "Oh fuck!" You know, you'll you'll yeah. know a ton of shit that he's done. All right, I'll have to definitely look for him. So, so watching, what was your overall impression? Well, of this I, I kept thinking of you when I was watching this. Because I, I think it was the last podcast that you said something along the lines of if you if you got the exact same script and gave it to two people and had uh, them film it, that you would get two completely different movies. Right. Something along those lines. And that's what I thought of this film. I, I had a hard time watching it because I love... A Bucket of Blood so much. It's such a wonderful movie, and I love it, and I, I love the characters, and they, the, the remake, I, I like the concept of it. I really like the idea of, okay, I'm going to get this film, and I'm going to update it, and I, I'm 
kind of surprised that that doesn't happen more often. There are so many movies out there, so many movies that are in the public domain that anyone could pick up and just start to fiddle with and mess with and, and redo if they wanted to. And I'm surprised yeah. that there aren't more people out there who are like, hey, hey, this film's in public domain. I'm going to do this to it. And so I like the idea of getting a bucket of blood and updating it, and especially because this movie came out in 1995, and that's when I graduated high school. And that period in time, I remember a lot of coffee shops and a lot of poetry slams and a lot of really? open mic nights and a lot of a lot of people trying really hard to be artistic. Hmm. See, that's I, that's interesting because that is where it kind of I liked it. Okay, I liked it. I really appreciated it. I would I would rather watch the original, mm -hmm. uh, but I felt this movie really had its heart in the right place, and the movie got it. You know, the movie got what the original was about, and basically did that. Shadow Stevens was a great pick. He just he <laughs> Shadow was so, Stevens. He was so oh man this and you know I loved it but see I I missed that coffee you know coffee shop culture of the 90s that you're talking about so I felt it was really kind of misplaced you know cause it wasn't I, I it wasn't misplaced for me I think that it would be much better now in hipster culture yeah yeah it it was weird to watch it was weird to watch this movie and to see all of these art people and artistic people and everybody and to not see a bunch of tattoos and piercings and body piercings. I kind of expected that with the, the crowd that supposedly all of these artistic people in this movie. Yeah. But I remember, I vividly remember, 94, 95, 96, going to see some movie late at night, and then afterwards it's 9 or 10 o'clock, a bunch of, you know, all of us, and we're young, and we go, oh, well, hey, let's go grab some coffee and talk about the movie. And I can't imagine doing that now. Yeah. Because now it's like, let's go grab a coffee. What are you, kidding me? It's 10 o'clock. I need to go home. i got to wake up early. I have a job and responsibility. But I remember that 1995 as being that, sort of a time. I'm going to go watch uh, a midnight showing of uh, Interview with a Vampire, and then there's this coffee shop we can go to, and we can hang out and talk about it, and they might be doing Poetry Slam, and so I remember a lot of pretentious people in that mid-90s, and, and I think because I was one of them, <laughs> so it really felt like a bizarre time capsule to me. So I remember a yeah. lot of people who really thought that they were just the greatest thing in the world because of their strange art. <laughs> I, I, you know, I try. I got my top hat. I got my jacket. I, I try. Um, I, I just can't hit the level of pretentiousness that other people seem to be able to. And I'm yeah. a little disappointed in myself for it. You know, I, I, I feel less, less of a man. You know. I, I liked the Death Artist. I liked the remake of Bucket of Blood. I just, I just feel like they're just so. It's a completely different movie than a Bucket of Blood, which is weird because it, it seemed like there were huge chunks of time in which they just literally got the original script mm -hmm. and just had Shadow Stevens and Justine Bateman do the lines. There were yeah. huge chunks of of the exact same dialogue and the exact same scene and the exact same shots. And I was yeah. surprised by that. And yet somehow this, the, the remake just seemed so much darker and meaner and angrier than the movie that I fell in love with, you know? Uh -huh. Okay. So let's, I want to, I, let's go through this, 
um, I wanted to go through some of the characters okay. in the original and in this remake. Now, I'm going to skip the obvious one until the end. But um, Carla, the girl, the love interest in the movie. Yes. So I, the new one, Justine Bateman, I, I don't know. I forget. I don't know who she was in the original. No, I, she's still Carla, except I think in, in the remake she has some horrible last name that may only be mentioned once or twice. But yeah. Carla in the original Bucket of Blood, I love her. I saw I, a love I with her. I definitely liked her a lot better than the uh, Justine Bateman one because her Russian oh, Jesus. thing was was kind of killing me. It, it really seemed like Justine Bateman was just... They, I understand what they were going for. She's like a Euro trash sort of, you know, she thinks she's great and she's pretentious and bunch of makeup like I understand what they're what they were going for but it really just seemed like she was doing a bell a really bad bell a ghost impression mm-hmm. yeah but the original Carla that was played by by um uh, Barbara Morris she was in the Wasp Woman and Teenage Caveman and I just I love her the original Bucket of Blood, I, I love Carla. I always had a crush on her. I thought she was wonderful. And, you 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 know, you don't want her to die, and you, you want to make sure that she lives through the end of the movie. But Justine Bateman's Carla, I just wanted her to die. <laughs> through the whole movie, I'm just like, can't this be different in that Justine Bateman gets killed? Can she just get utterly decapitated or something because they just hated her so much. <laughs> she was so annoying. Yeah. yeah. But I really yeah, like... That accent did not help. No, it, it did not. Just wasn't even, it wasn't coming off real or anything. It was... Yeah. There were some times where it seems like it, it was fading a little bit. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Shadow Stevens... I just kept saying that name throughout the entire movie because it's like, I can't, you, Shadow Stevens. <laughs> I think I quoted um, Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars. I was watching the movie and that his name came up in the credits and just, Shadow Stevens. Now that's a name I've not heard in a long time. I know. Yeah. A long time. Uh-huh. God, Shadows, wow, right? He's he's one of those people, it's like, why are you famous? You know, what yeah. have you ever done? Why are you... And I tried to, and I, and I tried to think, you? like, yeah, I tried to think, like, Shadow Stevens, he was huge, he was... Silence. Yeah. It's like, I, 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 I couldn't think of of why he was famous. I just knew he was famous. I knew his his voice, his face. I knew you say Shadow Stevens, and I'm like, oh, yeah, Shadow Stevens. I have no idea how I know him. I just know Shadow Stevens. Uh He equates more, from this movie to the last movie, he equates more to Burt Convy in the original movie in that why the fuck was Burt Convy ever a thing? Why was he famous? Why was he somebody who would show up in things, you know? He wasn't particularly good at anything. Shadow Stevens was, is kind of the same thing. Well, at least uh, uh, Bert Convy was uh, like a game show host. I know that. I, after, but he was on game shows well before that. Bert Convy. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's right up there with Shadow Stevens, maybe. But I really... the the It's difficult to talk about which one I like better, because I really like the the Maxwell, the, the windbag art guy from the original as well. 
uh, the Jul- Julian Burton. I yeah. have no idea who that is, but apparently he did a lot of TV. He was on The Outer Limits and Rawhide, Hill Street Blues, and stuff like that. It, his was, was, you know, a windbag, but he wasn't a bad guy. Maybe he was right. a little bit clueless, but he meant well. I felt like Shadow Stevens was more of a prick. Uh-huh. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, maybe some of that wasn't acting. Right. I mean, I don't know Shadow Stevens, but I can't imagine that he's like Mother Teresa. <laughs> oh, you would you know? be surprised. <laughs> Don't you know who I am? I'm Shadow Stevens. <laughs> now, Leonard is the guy who owns the coffee shop. Right. And um, in the original Bucket of Blood, he was played by Anthony Carbone, and he's like like a legendary Roger Corman second fiddle guy. Yeah. Great he's, character. He, I really liked his character. Um, yeah. Not as much he's, as the new one as the original, but his character to me, you know, and let's see if you agree on this, he just struck me as just being a total poser. You know, he was... The guy who owns the, the beret. The yeah, he would wear the beret just... Cause, so he would kind of fit in, but he, he was making money out of the coffee shop. That's all that really mattered. Yeah. You know, he, he didn't really care about beatniks or art or anything like that. He cared about if he could sell some art. He was definitely down with that. But he was he, basically I, uh, kind of a poser. It was like, eh, there's good money in here. <laughs> you know? I had a... I had a feeling that the Leonard in the original seemed to be more worried at the fact that he might somehow be responsible for all of this. Mm-hmm. Where he, 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 in the new one, I had a really hard time with Leonard because I I used to watch a lot of Scrubs. Was he on so, Scrubs? Yeah, Sam Lloyd. He was Ted the Lawyer on Scrubs. He was in almost every episode of Scrubs, and Scrubs ran for, what, like nine seasons? He was in every episode of that as just this weak, weaselly, loser lawyer. So when I first saw him, I'm like, oh, my God, that's that guy from Scrubs. So I'm not sure if his character in The Death Artist was more cowardly or if I was just seeing him like that because I've seen so much scrubs. Hmm. So I had a hard time with that. Like, I like him as an actor. I fell in love with him on scrubs, but I'm not sure if he did a, a, as good a job or as worth a job as the, as Leonard in A Bucket of Blood. I, I have a hard time. Yeah. I felt like he was more of an a-hole at first in the new one, and but then when he found out everything, he he seemed way more cowardly than Anthony Carbone was. Right. But the but the big the the main problem that I have with the Death Artist because I think it's a, it is a really wonderful movie, and I like it. I think it's a good remake. I like the idea of updating it to the modern times, and I really do think that you could update that now. You could update that twenty years from now. This is a film that really was the original Bucket of Blood was a wonderful look at culture in the 50s. You could do this in the 70s. You could do this in the 80s. You could just keep redoing a Bucket of Blood for all of these different time periods. And I like the the concept of the remake. The only problem that I have is with uh, their Walter Paisley. It's a very dark dude. Yeah. I don't have a problem with Anthony Michael Hall. I think he's a, a, I actually think he's a fairly good actor. He had a show, The Dead Zone, on TV for a really long time. Uh-huh. And I remember watching a number of those episodes and liking it and liking him. I have no problem with him as an actor, but he played this pretty damn dark. Yeah. More yeah. brooding. And it was a lot gorier than the original was. 
Oh yeah, oh yeah, it was a lot gorier. And also, I I don't think his uh, sculptures were as good as Dick Miller's sculptures were. Dick Miller's yeah. sculptures were more artistic. His sculptures were a lot more graphic as well. Yeah. I didn't like the other two guys who took the photographs of the dead animals, the roadkill artists. I liked them because I felt that they were purposefully in the film to be the voice of the person inside me who thought that this was just a ripoff. Hmm. Like maybe they were written in the script to be the person because like from they were convinced that Walter Paisley was ripping them off. So they just kept saying, Oh, Hey, look, here comes Mr. Plagiarism. Hey, what other ideas have you stolen today? You don't have an original bone in your body. And I felt that they were purposefully there to kind of as like a in like a, like an in joke, like a tongue in cheek sort of like, okay, yes, we're remaking this film. We understand it. People are going to be pissed off at us, you know? Yeah. But yeah, they were kind of annoying. <laughs> the red-headed one, I felt like I knew him in something, but I forgot to look him up. I forgot to IMDB that guy, but uh-huh. he he seems to be someone who I've seen in a bajillion things before. Yeah. There was another face I was kind of surprised to see, and I don't Which know one, if you would Dave? notice. The, um, hmm. One of the cops, the cop that Walter Paisley killed. Yeah, in well, remake, what? In the remake, <laughs> we're going back now. This was Scotty Baldwin from General Hospital. He was the one who was originally married to Laura before she ran off with Luke. Oh, yeah? Uh-huh. I thought he was like extremely overacting, but if you if you're telling me now that he started in General Hospital, then I can go. Oh well, there's the reason for that. Exactly. Because that guy was just getting like Bert Convy lines and then trying to squeeze every last bit of drama from every damn sentence. Like he was really going for it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, we get it. Like. Like, I, like, okay, I felt like I was watching community theater every time he would show up. Like, I, I never thought I'd say this, but I, I really wish Bert Convy was here. Yeah. Because at least he was a square, you know? Uh-huh. But I got the feeling that in the remake, oh, he wants to be like a, in, a, in a De Niro movie, you know? Mm-hmm. That whole scene... And, like, that's all I'm going to do because I don't want to really do, derail you too much. Um, mm-hmm. That whole scene was much, much better in the original. Played out really yeah. flat on, in, the, in the remake. Yeah, because he, he, I, I feel like in the original, Walter Paisley was just an accidental victim of circumstance. Exactly. And, and he... he Ended up taking a dark turn, but he was really sweet and innocent. But Anthony Michael Hall was less of a victim of circumstance. You weren't rooting for Anthony Michael Hall's character. I felt like when, in the remake, when Alice showed up, and in the original, Alice was Alice the Awful, and she was just, like, an annoying bitch. And in the remake, she's like a... Like a... Like a hot chick who shows up in music videos. In the remake, she had better tits. Yeah. Oh yeah. So I was I, I was kind of a fan of that. But I I when she started like going off on Walter and it's like you don't belong here. You're a poser. You're just some loser trying to fit in. I I when I see that scene in the original. I'm like, oh, my God, Alice the Awful, she's really horrible. It's like, I hope she dies. But then when I hear, like, the the big tits Alice say that, I'm like, well, you're mean, but nothing that you're saying is a lie. Yeah, and there's, there's a big difference between 
grabbing a piece of clay, molding something stupid, and saying, "Okay, there it is. It's art," and spitting cake at somebody. Yeah, you know, I I, I always loved it when Dick Miller just she says make something out of this, and he just smashes it and says, you know, hand or whatever, and everyone's laughing. And then Anthony Michael Hall spits cake in her face, and everyone's just kind of shocked and not doing anything about it. Mm-hmm. But I totally agreed with Alice in the remake. Anthony Michael Hall's Walter Paisley was just kind of like a like a wannabe loser schmuck trying to fit in, and he was dark. Walter Paisley, Dick Miller's Walter Paisley, he was someone who was sweet, and you want to take care of him, and you're rooting for him, and you hope he does well. Anthony Michael yeah. Hall's Walter Paisley is he's going to take a gun to a school and you've got to do something about him. Right. You know? Mm-hmm. I, I didn't like that. I, I love the remake. I think it's really, really good. And I'm surprised at how loyal it was to the movie. And I, But he, his Walter Paisley just really ruins that movie for me. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. It, it had its, its heart in the right place. It really brought through the pretentiousness and the feel, you know, but in other parts it really kind of missed the ball. And uh, like I said, I would rather watch the original. Yeah. The original is just wonderful. Mm -hmm. God, I just love that movie. I'm not sure what it is about that movie, but I just absolutely love it. I've just been obsessed with it. There was a period in time, one summer, like 1997 or 98, and it was during the summer, and I just decided I'm going to watch this every day. I'm going to watch it every day from May to August. I'm going to try and watch it every single day, and I'm going to see how long it takes for me to just hate this movie. Because May, June, July, August, that's a really long time, and eventually I'm going to hate this movie. And I probably watched it about five or six times a week, and by the time August came around, you know, I didn't hate it. I just loved it more. I noticed more things, and I was saying all the lines, and I was noticing. Not, not only was I saying lines, but, like, I knew all the gestures. I knew the facial gestures. I knew the way the eyebrows moved. I became just absolutely obsessed with this movie. I thought I would hate it, but, oh, God, it's just a wonderful, cute little movie. Mm-hmm. I don't want to hang out at the green door. I don't want to hang out at the Jabberjaw. <laughs> yeah. Jabberjaw sounds like a really bad comedy club. Not yeah. like a place that you're going to go and watch um, some weird blonde chick play with a toy monkey. <laughs> Although that was an awesome scene. Uh, I really yeah. like that. You, you must have watched Space, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, it really it really reminded me of the rabbit scene in space. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good that's a good connection. I'm just I'm, and also I, I think I said this I've said this before, but I, I'm really surprised that it took me over a decade to find this goddamn movie, especially considering uh and this is Will Farrell's first movie. Mm-hmm. First time he was ever in a motion picture. Uh, David Cross has a much larger part than I thought. Yeah. Because I heard that David Cross was in this film, and I thought, oh, okay, he's going to have one or two lines, and then you're never going to see him again. But he kept popping up throughout this entire movie. He, he was actually very good. He held his own nicely. Yeah. And uh, she has a blink, and you miss her part, but... Um, I forget her name, but she was near the end, and I God, I forgot who she played, and I forgot her name, but she appeared in a lot of uh, movies from Christopher Guest. She was in uh, Best in Show, and she was in A Mighty Wind. Yeah. I believe she was in... I believe Jan she was Hooks? in the Legally Blonde movie that I was forced to watch. Was it Jan Hooks? No, no. Um, big, dumb, older, blonde. 
with uh, fake looking lips. She oh uh, she was Stifler's mom in those American Pie movies. Okay. Oh, started on SCTV. No, she wasn't in SCTV. No. She's younger than that. Oh man, I'm shooting blanks all over the fucking place. <laughs> But she was Stifler's mom in all those damn American Pie movies, and she has a small part in this. It was surprising to see her. I mean, this has a pretty good cast. So I'm surprised that it took me so goddamn long to find this movie. Like, what the hell, Showtime? (laughs) Why was it so hard to do this? Mm-hmm. And it's a shame that this wasn't a success, because, again, I would have liked to have seen some... I, I, I would like to see some other remakes. Yeah. I had an idea. I mentioned in an interview, like in 98 or 99, um, that my dream was to see, like, a big-budget, dark and gritty remake of Planet from Outer Space. Dark and gritty? I was working on yeah. a script that was going in a completely different way. But, yeah, it, it was always my belief that it's like, you know, Planet Night from Outer Space, it, it, it's a pretty good concept, and, you know, aliens resurrecting the dead in order to scare the humans, and the humans kind of being the bad guys and refusing to acknowledge that anything's happening or that this that these aliens even exist. And, you know, I, thought, I always thought it was a good concept, and, like, if, if someone just... It was my belief back then that Ed Wood, if he just had money, then these films could have been so much better than they were. Yeah. And so if, if like, a Tim Burton or something just spent, like, $10 million or $20 million and made, like, a like a, like a a decent version of Planet X from Outer Space, that people would be impressed by it. So then some company went and did it. Yeah. Yeah, it's well, it's just, just called Plan Nine, and it's, it's all dark and gritty. And Mr. Lobo stars in it as the Criswell right. character, right? And for the longest time, like I refused to acknowledge the movie's existence because number one, that was my idea at first, and number two, motherfuckers didn't even call me. Lobo? Lobo? No, it, 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 no, the makers of the movie. Like, oh. come on. Like, I wasn't doing anything. I could have been Mexican man in background. Uh I mean, what the hell? But now I'm kind of like, okay, if I, maybe I'll watch it. Uh Uh-huh. If the movie ever even gets released, I'm not even sure if they, because they've been saying that it's coming out for like the past couple of years. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Like, at least five. Yeah at least five years. You know, when I heard I um I heard they were coming out with it and I don't know if you know are you familiar with David Rock Nelson? No. Strange dude makes a lot of movies in his mom's basement and stuff like that. He was awesome. talking about Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's kind of an awesome kind of a guy. Um he's pretty genuine, you know? Which yeah. is sort of what I like about him. Um, he was talking about making one, and that's when I put my script, script aside, you know, and might go back to it one day. Not really sure. But at that time, yeah. it seemed to me like Plan 9 was just getting a bit too hot, where I didn't want to be one in the mix. Yeah. You know. The, I, the gritty Plan 9 that I was pissed off that I wasn't a part of, they originally wanted to release it on 999. I remember that was the date that they were shooting for, that that the remake of Plan 9 was going to come out on 9909. 090909. And they totally (laughs) missed that. So then they said, okay, 090910. And now I think it might actually be coming out sometime soon. But still, it's been been a number of years since 090909. And it didn't come out then. But I like the concept of there's so many, like, old movies that people think are bad. And if someone just just picked up and dusted off 
um, the giant claw, it, they might be able to do something good with it, you know? Mm-hmm. There's so many little lost gems out there uh-huh. that someone could do something with. Like, I saw somewhere that they did a, a bizarre animated version of the original Night of the Living Dead, because that's in the public domain. So someone just took the audio and then had a bunch of different animators animate that various scenes. Domain. Yeah. Apparently, uh, what's his name, uh, George Romero, he didn't copyright the original. Oh, no. Ever. Well, no, 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 no. I know Night of the Living Dead is in the public domain. I didn't know that that work was in the public domain. Yeah. Some someone got the movie and they just got the audio and then they got a bunch of different animators to animate various parts of it. And they turned it into this bizarre, weird, beautiful, horrible, strange film. And and I rooted for that because okay, they, why aren't more people being experimental with all of these films in the public domain? Yeah. That was a pretty interesting movie. I wouldn't necessarily say it was good. There was certainly some spectacular parts of it. You know? The original Night of the Living Dead? No, the one you're talking about. Oh, the yeah. Animated, I think it was called. Yeah. Yeah, there were you some know? just... Like, I... Just like just like the Death Artist. Like, I, I'm not sure if I like this, but I like the concept of it, and I'm going to support it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I could, I could, I get behind it. That doesn't necessarily mean that I thoroughly enjoyed every second of it, but I understand what you're going for, and I think there should be more of this. So yeah, hooray. what I would say is I don't necessarily like this, but I appreciate it. Yeah, another one that I'm thinking of is, it, it, what's the name of the guy who made Hardware Wars? Do you remember Hardware Wars? I have not seen it in years, if I've ever actually seen it. But, oh, Hardware yeah. Wars. No, 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 no. Yeah, Hardware Wars. Um, well, Mr. Logo used to have him on a lot, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he... Oh, yeah. Within the last five or ten years, the guy who did Hardware Wars completely redid Plan 9 from Outer Space, but with, like, marionettes. Yeah. And he called it, like, Plan 9.1 from Outer Space or something like that. Yeah. And it was just like that animated it's like, well, this isn't the best thing in the world, but it, again, I I support this. Mm-hmm. Like, I remember my friend Tom and I, we wanted to go see, um, we wanted to go see Starship Troopers when it was out in theaters, but yeah. we didn't want to give money to it, so we went and we talked to the person at the box office and, and said, Look, we want to go see Starship Troopers, but we don't want to pay money for it because we feel that when you purchase a ticket, you're voting and you're sending a message to Hollywood. We want more of this movie, and we don't want more of this movie, but we want to watch it. So can we buy a ticket for this art film that we don't really want to see and go sneak into Starship Troopers? And the guy (laughs) went out of the box office. He just, without saying anything, he just exited the box office, and I thought we were going to get in trouble. And then he walked out to the outside of the theater and he shook the both of our hands. <laughs> and then he walked wow. back in and said, okay, two for that art film? Nice. And we saw Starship Troopers. And Did you did you not like Starship Troopers? I didn't realize it was going to be as tongue-in-cheek. As it, no, I was upset with Starship Troopers because I do not like the concept of gritty R-rated movies with toys for kids. Yeah. I I never understood that, and it pisses me off. So I remember when I went to go see Starship Troopers, uh there were about five parents with their kids in the theater. Little kids, and they've already got the Starship Troopers toys, and they've got, one of them had like one of the alien toys in their hands, and they were scarred for life by this goddamn movie. (laughs) <laughs> it's like, what the yeah. fuck? You just took your five-year-old son to go see this gritty R-rated movie that features Doogie Howser. I, I think that if we if we took Starship Troopers 
and we took out Doogie Hauser, and we took out Casper Van Dien, and we took <clears throat> out what is her name? I, I Denise Crosby. Denise Richards. Yeah, take yeah. her out. Take out everything that is like quote unquote the plot of Starship Troopers. And you've got a piece of fucking and you've got a piece of fucking genius sitting in the background and that's really what I watched that movie for. All the shit that's going on behind everything else. And it was a beautiful film. Thinking, that, that was Vorhoven, uh, wasn't it? I'm pretty sure. Who did Robocop? You know, and yeah. you can see that. You know? The subtext of Star Trek Trip Troopers and as much as he can get away with with getting out the totalitarian government and just strange touches that were going on back there, I, I absolutely fucking love that. I'm going to have to go back and absolutely, see that now. I absolutely love that, man. You know what? That might be a good one for a commentary. Yeah, that might, that might be a that good one. That might be good for a commentary. You know, so much shit like... Um, like there was the bit about oh man there was there was a murderer who was caught in the morning tried in the afternoon he was going to be executed that evening yeah and it was mandatory for citizens to watch yeah <laughs> which was which in and of itself was great but then they come apart they come across this part where they're showing how dangerous the bugs are and they put in a cow, and they pick up the cow, and it starts to rip apart the cow, and they put the yeah. big fucking censored block in front of it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that's great. That's great. Yeah. We're going to watch the public ex- execution, but we can't watch the cow die. Nice. <laughs> nice. You know? Okay. But just, just tons of little beautiful nuggets like that. All throughout Starship Troopers. The main I'm going to have to go back and the main I'm going to have to go back is, and rewatch that. Yeah. The main movie is like, meh, it's okay. You know, not bad. Yeah. It's, it's a stupid action-y Casper Van Dien thing. You know? Nothing terribly much to write home about. The dizzy chick got me kind of hot. Like her what wife. happened to him? What happened to Casper Van he, Whatever. He's still poking up in in things from time to time. Uh, they've made several other Starship Trooper movies. Yeah, they he did. Was and there was a cartoon for a while three. too. It was in, it was a cartoon, yeah. Mm-hmm. He was in three. I think we're up to four or five now. And like he's done tremors. a lot of other little yeah, like Tremors, yeah. Uh, yeah. He's done a lot Tremors, of little bad movies. Well, I will look forward to seeing him in Sharknado 4. Oh, there you go. There you go. That sounds like a perfect... It just seems like you would be in that. Tutor- that sounds like a perfect vehicle for him. Kurt Angle was in Sharknado 2. Really? Yeah. I felt so bad for Kurt Angle because, like, I see Kurt Angle pop up at the end of Sharknado 2, and I'm like, aww. Stupid Batista's in Guardians of the Galaxy, and you're in Sharknado 2. Poor guy. Like, oh, I feel so bad for you. It, it, it's funny because it, what's her name? Stacy Keebler. She was a yeah. she was a like a like a wrestler woman, and then she quit wrestling, and then dated George Clooney. And then suddenly she was on the cover of every magazine, and now I think most people know who she is. And I, I felt the need to, like, I, it, whenever I saw some old woman and she was reading a, a Us Weekly and Stacey Keebler's on the cover, I wanted to go up to her and be like, that chick you're reading about, she used to be in wrestling. Like, I wanted to let everyone know that. But then when I saw Guardians of the Galaxy, I'm like, She was she was in it. No, no, uh, Batista. Oh, Batista. Like I, 
like, I wanted to tell everyone that Stacey Keebler used to be a wrestler, but then when this big, huge Marvel movie comes out and it's one of the main stars in it is a wrestler, I'm like, I hope no one notices that a wrestler is in this. Because mm-hmm. I don't want... I don't want people to turn away from this film. But shh, don't tell anyone that Batista's in it. Stacy Keebler had the best ring entrance ever. Yes, she did. Oh. She had an amazing pair of legs. I also appreciated her because I felt like all the other women in wrestling were just like they couldn't they couldn't wait to be on Playboy and be all nude and be everything like that, but she never did anything like that, and I respected yeah. her more for that. Yeah. Like her and Lita. Lita, well, Lita, Lita could actually wrestle. Yeah, you know, no, Lita, Lita, Lita could Lita actually wrestle. Watching the ring. Stacey Keebler was originally the winner of some fan contest on WCW. Yeah. Like, like, you can be a Nitro girl. And then she was just some WCW fan who was chosen. So she was never really meant really? to be in this anyway. Yeah. Yeah, she was never meant to actually, you know, she she had no training or skills or anything like that. Yeah. Absolutely great to look at. So, oh, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Man. It almost kills me, though. It always kills me, though, going back to Guardians of the Galaxy. When you watch wrestling, and I first noticed this with Diamond Dallas Page when he was in the Devil's Rejects, is because all of those guys are so fucking big, when you're on, yeah. watching wrestling, they don't look that particularly big. You they know? don't look that big. They don't look that yeah. big. That's because they're all primarily the same size. Which is why yeah. Tom Cruise like, only Diamond, acts with other like five foot two individuals. Like Diamond Dallas Page, he always came off to me like kind of a little guy, you know. But then you he see always, him in this movie with regular yeah, actors, monster. and he looks freaking huge in that movie. He is a monster, and it was the same thing with Batista. You know, I didn't find out. I found out shortly after, but like when I was watching it, I didn't know it was Batista. It was like this guy's fucking huge. Batista never looked that big to me. I mean, he looked big. You know. He just didn't look monstrously big the way he actually is, you know? I like Batista in Guardians of the Galaxy, but I like Batista in Guardians of the Galaxy because his character was kind of clueless and a little bit stupid. and And I always hated Batista, so I felt that he fit because I I don't think he was acting too much when he was trying to be kind of this clueless, mindless, roid rage machine. I didn't feel like he was acting at all. It's like, yeah. it's like sure, Batista is good in Guardians of the Galaxy, but that's because that character is 100% perfect for him. You can't just put him in, you can't put Batista in The Departed, because I don't think he can act his way out of anything else other than this wonderful, mindless Roy's machine that he played in this movie. Well, again, he was he was also coming up at the place where I was sort of fading out, you know. Um, yeah. Like before Randy Randy Orton got hot, before you know, right around when Eugene was was in there, you know. At this point. The Rock had pretty much left. Mick Foley had pretty much left. Stone Cold wasn't really doing anything. So, you know, I, I kind of faded in my interest. There wasn't anybody really there anymore except The Undertaker, who is more of, I mean, he shot, you know. Yeah. He, you don't watch him for the dazzling wrestling or anything. You sort of watch The Undertaker because at one point he was great, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. At those days, kind of behind, but he was pretty much the only one who was sort of left back there, and that wasn't enough to to hold me sticking around. I I might get back into wrestling because apparently at their last pay per view, Sting showed up. Yeah, and I just didn't think that Dream of the Blue Turtles was that good of a fucking album, so I don't know why people got all excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> I always liked Sting. I always liked 
that weird crow thing that popped up like around around the, you know to fight the NWO. I always liked that thing. I never cared for Sting, but I liked the Sting of that one period in time, and I I might care to watch Sting again. Yeah, you know, I had, at least one last time, maybe with I, the Undertaker. I had posted that on a friend's status, and then quickly followed it up in like right when the Ferguson riots started happening. I had followed <laughs> up with, I had followed up with, like, no, I'm I'm actually kind of excited to see this because I really want to see a member of the police get the shit kicked out of him by Booker T. <laughs> <laughs> Five times. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, uh, he was on TNA when I was watching TNA for a little while. Uh, I had liked TNA, and then when you got the whole kind of, oh, they yeah. sort of lost me, and they sort of lost me in that whole. It, it was too soon for them to go be going to war with WWE. You know, yeah, and that seemed to be what was happening. They got Hulk Hogan, and because of that, McMahon brings uh, Hitman Hart back. You know, it just, yeah, they they TNA quickly went from we're going to be an exciting alternative to see what WWE stars we have this week. Exactly, yeah. And when I first started watching it, I. I I was really interested in the fact that they had wrestlers that I hadn't really seen in a while. And yeah. when I saw them on WWE, I really hated them. You know, I didn't like them at all. And for some reason over on TNA, they, they were much better. They were much more interesting for some reason. You know, so like, like Christian, I hated him, man. Oh, Yeah. When he was with uh, Edge and what were they, the New Brood or something like that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the New Brood. Wow. Yeah, but then going over to TNA, he was he was pretty much one of their big stars. Yeah. And he was interesting. I was really kind of into him as a wrestler. You know, then he goes back to yeah, you know, it just in that mix. I mean, I was glad to see McFoley show up again because. I would watch him do anything. I don't know why that boy doesn't act more. I really don't. Who? Mick Foley. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. And he's a really wonderful author. I haven't read his books. I know he's a great speaker. I love, you know, if I catch him on a podcast or something like that, I absolutely just love to listen to him just tell stories and shit. I was impressed at the fact that when I read his first book, it's this huge, massive, like, 800-page, big, huge book. And it's him from the time he was born to right before he signed up in WWF. And, it, yeah. and I thought that that was impressive because, like, here you are writing your first book, and you haven't even gotten to, like, your major, the major part of your life yet. And I was really impressed with that. And he wrote, a, like, a fiction novel that, that I was impressed with. And it was like this bizarre, violent, dirty coming of age story. And I was like, and I was impressed by it. He's actually quite good. Like, unfortunately, yeah. I I can admit that I've read a number of wrestler biographies because I was a fan during the time in which that was popular. But he is really good. Him and Chris Jericho are are both wonderful. Yeah. Chris Jericho specifically, like he's fun to watch. And he's fun to listen to. He's fun to, to, to hear in an interview. And his books, he is even better. He, he's even better to read than he is to, to watch on TV. Yeah. I don't know when the last time was I saw him, but he's amazing. But a bucket of blood. <laughs> yeah. We, we've gone far afield there. Yeah. And uh, Bret Hart wrote wrote a big, huge, massive biography, too. Yeah. Bret Hart's biography is bizarre because Bret Hart apparently kept audio diaries of his life for the majority of his life. He would apparently yeah. carry some cassette recorder and just write, okay, September 14th, 
1987, I'm at dinner with the following people. So a, when it came time to write his biography, he, he, it's the most insanely detailed thing in the world. Yeah. Like his book will be, it's 1979, it's September 24th, it's a Thursday at 6.40 p.m., and I'm in this room with the following eight people. It's just insanely detailed. I, I would think he would be interesting just because he was just from such a, a dynasty of wrestling. Have you seen the movie, the documentary movie that he did? I think I might have. I don't know what it's called, though. I saw uh, Wrestling with Shadows. Yeah. It's really amazing. A documentary crew he got the okay from WWF to follow Bret Hart around for a year. And as it turns out, that year was also the year in which he be completely screwed over by the WWE. And there was nothing the WWE could do to stop the film because they already agreed that they uh -huh. could follow him around for a year. So it literally is just the slow and tragic deconstruction of one of the greatest stars in wrestling history by this major corporation. It's it's a dark, bizarre film. But it really is quite beautiful. Even someone who knows nothing about wrestling and who doesn't know who Bret Hart is could watch this film and be impressed by it, you know? I think I probably saw one, like, after that period where he was pretty much looking back on his life and already retired. I don't think I've seen that one. That one sounds good. Oh, no, it's really, really good. It's quite incredible. It, it follows him around throughout that entire period in time. Yeah. And you get, it's literally behind the scenes of the night in which he was screwed over in the title you see behind the scenes and there's one scene where uh, Vince McMahon says no cameras, but Bret Hart wears a wire. Yeah. So you, it's literally just insanely behind the scenes sort of stuff. It, it gets uncomfortable at times because you see everything. It's really quite amazing. Yeah. That sounds very interesting. Yeah. I think it's on Netflix. The next week. Really? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. And what's the question? Wrestling with Shadows, the the Bret Hart story, I think is what it's called. Yeah. I imagine in Canada it's their national film. <laughs> it's a national film, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. They will grab anybody in Canada. I mean, not that Bret Hart doesn't deserve it, but you know if you pull it if you pull a decent sized fish out of the river you're a national hero. <laughs> That's just Canada for you. Very nice. <laughs> Very nice. I I love Canada. I want to go to Canada. I like Scott Pilgrim. Scott Pilgrim's set in Canada. I have still not seen that movie. It hasn't popped up on anything. You know, really, that's a wonderful movie. That is a that is a wonderful, beautiful movie. It's unlike any other movie in the world, and it's a darn shame that that movie didn't be the number one movie in America that everybody loved. I mean, it really could have been a game changer if it was just it seen enough by more people. It's a beautiful film. Yeah. Why do you think it didn't do as good? It was too different. There's yeah. literally nothing else like it. It's just... <clears throat> it's absolutely incredible. Also, I think it wasn't advertised properly. I don't think that people knew what it was or yeah. how different it was. Or I think if, if they had just advertised it right, then it could have really been something. But And also, again, they released it in the middle of the summer, expecting it to be like the next big thing. Mm -hmm. Just like goddamn hot rod you know if you had released this in march or in september october november then it might have been different but you released it in like july august expecting it to be the next big thing this is going to be a game changer everyone should watch this now and of course it's bombed yeah because that's not how you advertise a movie as different and as beautiful as this film but 
Oh, uh, well. Should we wrap this up? I don't want to get between you and your GoPro. I got like another hour, uh, another half hour. Yeah, I mean, that's that's with the driving time, I'm saying five. You know, we got plenty of time. Okay, good. So I don't want to get between you and your new uh, device. Trust me, you won't. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Do you have any ideas for next week? Anything that just oh. screams off the top of your head? Yeah, actually. Because I've got an idea, but it's a bit odd. Well, we were talking about Jesus Camp. Yes. One of the What's greatest horror movies. Um, that's a wonderful idea. And I, I would I would love to watch Jesus Camp again. But no, I... I there's a Disney movie that I've never seen and that I think the majority of America has never seen, which is weird because it's a Disney animated movie, and, and you would think that every one of those had, has been taken apart and dismantled and just focused on with a laser scope because it's a Disney animated movie. But there's one that, that people just don't know about, and it's available on YouTube because it's so bizarre. And it's from 1941. It's essentially a war propaganda film. And it's uh-huh. called Victory Through Air Power. It's 1942. Because in 1941, this guy wrote a book called Victory Through Air Power. And it's, it's just this, this one guy who is like some doctor who, who had figured out the way that we're going to beat the Nazis. And so he wrote a book about it, and Walt Disney was so in love with it that he decided to make an animated movie based on this nonfiction book about World War II and about killing Germans and Japanese people. Walt Disney made an animated movie, and it's supposed to be beautiful. It's supposed to be a beautiful 1940s Disney animated film Yeah, about killing Nazis. Huh. It's entirely propaganda, and it's bizarre, but literally, it's the same people who did Alice in Wonderland, the same people who did Cinderella, the same people who did all of these classic Disney movies, also did this bizarre pro-America war propaganda movie, and it's it's weird because people are so obsessed with Disney, but if you went to the biggest Disney fan and you mentioned Victory Through Air Power, they will probably have no idea that that movie exists. Right. And I find it incredible that there are Disney movies out there, Disney animated movies, which are, like, sacred in America, that there that there's one that people just don't know about. Well, Disney made a propaganda movie, and people don't know about it. <laughs> I find that intriguing. Oh, and it's available on YouTube. Computer problem, so I can't find it yet. But I'll definitely find that on YouTube. Let's do it. All right. Disney. Disney Week. Movie. Yeah. It's a different kind of movie than we've done previously. Yeah. Absolutely bizarre that, that Walt... And Walt Disney spent his own money. It's not that the Disney studio decided to make this film... Walt Disney was so blown away by this book that he wrote that he decided to spend his own money to make an animated version of a nonfiction book about how we can beat Nazis. <laughs> and because of this, the U.S. government said, hey, this Walt Disney guy, maybe we should get him to make more to make more propaganda. So because of this movie, he did a bunch of the other war movies that he ended up doing, like... Um, Donald gets drafted, where he goes yeah. into the war, and uh, the Fuhrer's face, which I, which it is wonderful. Huh. Have cool. you ever seen the Fuhrer's face? It's a Spike Jones song too. Um, I know the Spike Jones song. Yeah, the song came from the animated movie where Donald Duck has a nightmare where he's a, a a German citizen making bombs for Adolf Hitler. And Adolf Hitler is in the cartoon with Donald Duck, and it's really bizarre. And the song was written specifically for this animated movie. 
Really? Yeah. For the, it, it's a it's a, it's a Donald Duck short, but it it was definitely created as a piece of propaganda as a as because that's what Walt Disney did after victory through air power. Really amazing. And you got to appreciate propaganda. Anybody's propaganda. Yeah. For for just the tilted world view. I'm, I'm not coming out to be pro Nazi here, okay? <laughs> but <laughs> you're going to see a, a, a very exaggerated view of how things are. Yeah. You know, and I and then to see that how that easily it that's taken as as being the truth by the populace. Yeah. I mean, there's a big argument in in just the um, film world about, and I forget her name, but uh, there there are big arguments as to whether or not she was a great director. Uh, she put out some really great work, but it was all Nazi propaganda. All of it. Okay. That's you know. interesting. Yeah. So now, is she no longer a great director because everything that she did was pro-Nazi? That's a wonderful debate. Mm -hmm. Like, is she... She's still a talented filmmaker. But if she's a Nazi, does that automatically cancel everything out? Going back to wrestling, it's like Chris Benoit. Right. Chris right, Benoit exactly. was one of the most amazing wrestlers in the world, but he kills his family, and we just have to wipe him off of the record books. Exactly. Uh -huh. He's the most amazing wrestler in the world. He's the most technically gifted wrestler in the world. He's amazing. He's wonderful. He kills his family. Let's forget he ever existed. Mm -hmm. I, I I always felt like he's so amazing. It's like, but you you just kill one wife and child, and then boom. <laughs> you can it be as amazing so as you want, but you but you kill your wife and child, and suddenly you're a bad guy. Mm -hmm. It seems so unfair, you know. It seems so unfair. You should be able to kill at least like three people. Yeah, and then get away with it, <laughs> or at least still be in the in the the record books for being so amazing. Oh, okay, so I got my internet going again. What's that? What's that movie again? Uh, Victory Through Air Power. 1942. The beginning of the film is an animated history of aviation, and that part of the film would be taken out and put in, like, Walt Disney Presents and, like, the, the, the Wonderful World of Color and all those Disney specials. But the movie came out in 1942, and then for 60 years it was just we're, it's not going to be re-released. We're not going to release this ever again. We're just going to sit on this and and the end. It was re-released on DVD as part of a collection of all the propaganda stuff that Walt Disney did. And that was really the first time that anyone ever realized that this existed. But even that DVD was kind of like a collector's edition DVD, so not a lot of people realize that this, that this exists. There we go. I got it. Okay, good. Victory through air power. Victory through air power. That sounds very doable. It's it's all over YouTube, and it's a, it's an official Walt Disney animated movie in the same list as Snow White and Wreck and Ralph and uh, Beauty and the Beast, and and yet the no one knows that this film exists, and no one knows that Walter Paisley is born. <laughs> Duncan knows. 
<laughs> See how I brought it back? I brought it that all back good. right there. It's called the that Circle of Life. <laughs> yeah. God, I love a bucket of blood. I was hoping that in the remake, when Walter killed the police officer, the narc, and then Mrs. Swicket comes, and the hand falls out, and the hand's dripping blood, and Walter's looking for something to catch the blood. I thought, here's the chance. Here is finally going to be the opportunity for an actual bucket of blood to be in the movie A Bucket of Blood. Because in the original Bucket of Blood, there is no bucket of blood. There is like a quarter saucepan of blood. But there is no bucket of blood. So I thought, here's your chance. Anthony Michael Hall, you must have a bucket in your house. Grab that bucket to catch the blood. And boom, we've got a title. But no, he grabbed a pan. So it's a pan of blood. Yeah. It was a cooking pot of blood. Yeah. Uh, Again, the original was so much better with Walter just like, you're going to shoot me. Don't shoot me. Please don't shoot me. You know, it was was so much more of the accidental death. Yeah. Anthony Michael Hall, he struck out in rage. Yeah, he turned from being a, a sort of ignorant, buffoony kind of guy who doesn't know what heroin is to a calculated killer, which didn't really play well. Yeah. You know, it was... Killing him was way too intentional. Whereas Dick Miller just lashed out out of fear and panic. Yeah, not really understanding what was going on. With Dick Miller, it was just a slighter fight response. Right. And he didn't control it. It just happened because he had a gun in his face. Anthony Michael Uh Hall was just a douchebag. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And And because of it, you know, you don't really get... You... You don't get behind his Walter as much. No, you do not. You do not. Although I appreciated the effort that they did to remake this movie, mm-hmm. and I think that you could remake it nowadays and it would still be relevant. Oh, I wanted to mention something. I don't remember the specific book, but we got this book in at my work, and it was like this big $40 book, and it was this coffee table book, and it was, was, I don't think we sold one, I don't think anybody sold one, but it was a career retrospective of this, like, award-winning illustrator Uh and a comic book artist. I don't remember who it was, although I have a feeling that it may have been the guy who did that comic strip, Mouse. It was not a comic strip, but it was a graphic novel, and it was about... the, it was about the Holocaust, except all of the Jewish people were mice, and all of the Germans were cats. Okay. I, 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 Art Spiegelman, I think, is who released this book, I, but I don't remember who. All I remember is, is that it was a beloved artist, and it was his career retrospective, and on the cover, it, it was a collage of his famous artwork, and then one quote. And it was a quote that he specifically chose to showcase how artists feel and how hard it is to be an artist and the artist's struggle. And it was just this tiny quote, and it just said, be a nose. Be a nose. And then on the bottom, it said, Walter Paisley, A Bucket of Blood, 1959. Nice. And when I saw that, I just reached out. I was like, yes, be a nose, Walter Paisley, Dick Miller. Oh, my God. I'm not going to buy this book because it's $40 and that's fucking crazy, but still, oh, my God. (laughs) How amazing is that? Be a nose. Mm -hmm. And that really made me appreciate Bucket of Blood more because it's just the artist's struggle. Be a nose. Uh Be a nose. 
<laughs> you want Dick Miller to be a good artist. You don't give a fuck about Anthony Michael Hall. He was a douchebag. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You just didn't have the feel for him that you did for Walter Paisley. Nothing against uh, Anthony Dick Michael Miller. Hall. He's an amazing actor. Yeah. He was a lot more cold-blooded. I mean, Dick Miller got that way, but even even when he was killing intentionally, there was something more there. You know, the girl was making fun of him, you know, so he killed her and made her a piece of art. Yeah. You know, but man, the, the guy who played Stewart in Mad TV made that movie. <laughs> How bizarre is that? What a and strange, be, what a strange random happenstance. Yeah, and I don't want to be too down on the movie. It was good. You know, it was. It was pretty good. It was good. It had certain failings. It didn't make it as good as the original, though. Yeah, in my opinion. But it's still a good movie. Like if it, it, it's. It, it, and it's an amazing thing to see side by side, to see this, to see this. One of the things, and, and maybe this is just me because I'm obsessed with the original Bucket of Blood, but I was uh, upset to see a song from the original not make it into the murderer's the remake. Song. Yeah. Yeah. Because he hears Walter, and he's being a busboy, and yes, he's killed, but he's going to try and forget about it. And what's playing on the stage at the green door? Some troubadour douchebag who happens to be singing a song, which apparently is a, like, a, like a traditional Irish song about a real-life story about this murderous guy, and, and everyone knew he was guilty, and then they killed him. And as it turns out, oops, he was innocent, and now we should feel bad about it. But here's Walter, and he's trying to be this. He's trying to forget about what he's done. And here's the guy on stage who keeps singing, go down, you murderer, go down. And he just feels so, you could tell he's feeling guilty, and he's being trying not to be weirded out by it. But the singer's yeah. just belting this song out, just go down, you murderer, go down. And he just feels so bad. And I just love that scene, and it's just so wonderful. and. Here's the freaking the death artist just showing new people playing classical music. <laughs> Not that I had anything against the nudity in this film. No. no. I liked the nudity. There's nothing wrong with that. I like the fact that there was more poetry in this, though. I uh, liked, I was, liked the... I was a fan of the nudity. Yeah. Very much so. But I, I did really like, who can make the monkey laugh? I can't. I can. Who can make the monkey laugh? I can. I can. And that part really got me, because there I am, and I'm going, wow, this is, a pretty, uh, this is a pretty loyal remake. I'm impressed with how loyal this is. They changed that opening poem a little bit, but this is a pretty accurate re Whoa, what the hell is going on? Yeah. Whoa, was, okay. Even though she was in it, I was not able to identify Mink Stoll. Yeah. And I, I, I seem to always have that problem. I cannot recognize her from movie to movie. Yeah. And, and, and she, she was... Been the I, laugh girl. I liked and, her more in that movie... But there was just something about that bizarre, I, I don't know, Native American or Samoan woman that they got to play her character in the original. Yeah. She, she has so much less screen time and so hardly any lines, but there's just something bizarre about her. And there's just something that, the, I don't know, I like that. 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 <laughs> My youngest daughter saw that part and she's like, wow, dad, that's weird. Can I watch the rest of the movie? And I'm like, no, no, no. Uh -huh. 
I'll keep playing the monkey laugh part for you if you want, but no, we're not going to watch the rest of the death artist. I will show you a bucket of blood, but I will not show you the rest of this. Yeah. Because I'm still trying to find a bunch of good little gems for Isabella to watch. Uh, uh, I, I showed her the original Night of the Living Dead. Yeah. And and she liked it, and she was a bit spooked out by it, but she liked the movie. But then when the ending came along, she just... Wait, that's it? <laughs> Wait, that's not... That can't be... That's the ending? There's got to be more, right? Is there more? Is there... Be, that's it? She was so pissed. Well, you know, you might want to show her that again when she's older and see if she, like, really gets the ending. You know, I mean, it's kind of strange that George Romero decides there to turn all political, you know. But yeah, it, it was great seeing the whole lynch mob mentality start coming out. And, you know, well, you just shot another black guy. That's really all you basically did. Yeah. And I know that George Romero has made maybe, I am guesstimating, about 50 different versions of Night of the Living Dead. Yeah. I may be overestimating, but he's made a bunch of different for Night of the Living Dead. But I specifically remember liking the one where instead of a black guy, it was a, it was a woman. Because he's made a bunch of different Night of the Living Dead, but there was one, and it was in color, and maybe in the 80s. Uh, you're not talking about the but Tom Savini one. Is that is that it? That might be the one I'm thinking of. Well, that had uh, Patricia Tallman playing the Barbara character. Except her character lives until the end. Yeah. And she shot Ben at the end. Yes. Yes, that's the one that I like. I like that one. But Ben was a zombie in that particular movie. Yeah. Oh, I meant to tell you my idea. I have an I have an idea for a night for a Night of the Living Dead prequel sequel. Yeah. Because um Johnny, the brother, the smart ass. He is, they're coming to get you, Barbara. So then uh-huh. here comes this zombie, and he fights with the zombie, and then he falls, and he hits his head on the tombstone, and is left there. And then the Barbara goes off. So my idea is for a Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, but in Night of the Living Dead. And it's the uh-huh. further adventures of Johnny because Johnny just had a mild concussion and he wakes up and he's like, where the hell's my sister? Right. Where the hell's my car? That's and he has no idea, idea that zombies know. are out and he just, he actually, you know, it's like, wait a second, she just left me there? She assumed I was dead? I just hit my head. It doesn't mean that it's not an automatic death sentence. How could you just leave your brother there? And so he ends up, like, traveling through the entire Night of the Living Dead movie, and at the end, he decides to do, like, a Walking Dead and disguise himself as a zombie, and he saves the sister. Uh Uh-huh. That's my idea. I just need to actually get any sort of um, time and the desire to write it, but I think it's a good idea. I, I think it's a good idea, too. Yeah. Night of the Living Dead, The Further Adventures of Johnny. Because I love that Living character, and then he disappears immediately in the beginning, and then all you have to see is some uh, uh, catatonic white chick. Right. But just because yeah, he bumped his head on a, on a tombstone doesn't automatically mean, like, oh, well, he's obviously dead. I'm going to take off now. Yeah. Yeah. That would be good, because that would be a completely different take. I mean, they make... Night of the Living Dead gets remade so often, and it's so often. Yeah, but this is like a funny twist to it, because Johnny's such a wonderful character. Yeah. Because he's there, like, at the grave, and he's laughing, and he's making jokes and doing funny voices, 
And so I figure, like, he takes off and ends up going to a diner, and it's the diner where the the African-American hero guy fights with zombies. And he just ends up kind of traveling through the town and discovering zombies on his own. And in my version that's in my head, he also meets up with a bunch of uh, Mexican cooks that have meat cleavers. But I think that's just me just dreaming in my head. That might not actually make it to the final product. But eventually he comes to save his sister. I think I'm... Why why wouldn't you want that? Why wouldn't you want the Mexican cooks? Well, the only reason I wanted to add the Mexican cooks with the meat cleavers is so that I could actually have a part in something like this. (laughs) Because there are a few parts for Mexicans who aren't really Mexicans in movies. Okay, to to get a little more racist on this subject, what if they start following Johnny like mariachi? Ooh, now that's a good idea. El Mariachi, now that's a really good movie. And Desperado. I, I wasn't thrilled with it. Desperado I liked. El Mariachi, Desperado was... I, I like the concept of it. Yeah, again, I like the concept of this. I understand where you're going through, and also you, like, put yourself in medical experiments for, like, a month in order to afford making this movie. So the least I can do is watch it and be entertained by it. I really liked it... Once Upon a Time in Mexico with Johnny Depp. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, he, I like that. Coined, he coined the phrase that perfectly encapsulates my feelings about my own race. Are you a Mexican or a Mexican? Yeah. And I'm definitely a Mexican, but in Oklahoma, everyone assumes me. Everyone sees me and assumes that I'm Mexican. But I want to oh. tell these old white people, no, I'm actually a Mexican. I grew up loving wrestling. I'm not. I had a monster truck phase. I, I'm not one of these. I'm not what you think I am. Mm-hmm. I met Walter Cronkite once. You have to give me a chance, white people. <laughs> I saw Neil Diamond in concert once, and it was awesome. <laughs> I you got free you tickets. Could, it was great. Get your, you could definitely get your Mexican card pulled for that. I could. He played Sweet Caroline twice. The first time he told everyone, it's like, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna sing this song twice. The first time, just me sings it, not you guys. Do not sing along with me. Everyone always sings along with this song, and I never get to hear myself sing it. So I'm going to sing it. Don't anybody sing along. The second time I sing it, you guys can all sing along with me. But just give me this first time. So we sang the song twice, and I thought that was bizarre. Maybe that's because half of the stadium was, they got their tickets for free like me, but I still thought that that was a bit weird. (laughs) Neil Diamond. I used to be obsessed with the song Love on the Rocks. They used to be my go-to karaoke song. Love on the Rocks. Okay, no surprise. I used to be obsessed with karaoke, and I I had a plot. The second karaoke song that I sang could be whatever I wanted, but the first song has to be a song that you would be deeply surprised to hear a weird Mexican-looking guy like me sing. And then once I've won you over with that, then I can sing whatever weird song I want. So the first one would always be like a California Dreamin' or uh, like a Come Together or a Yesterday or something like that, like the, like a like a song from the birds or the yeah. kinks or some song like that where old people are really impressed. So then I can start singing the Weird Al Yankovic or the, the metal version <laughs> of a Britney Spears song. But I got to win them over first. So sometimes, like, you'd see me come up and I'm, like, dressed all horrible and ragged and I'm just this weird-looking sickly guy. And then I just get up there. Love on the rocks. <laughs> Ain't no big surprise. I don't know if you see me like that. They just like their head up like a dog. They just go, huh? They just look up. I oh? have to. I have to get myself moving now. Okay. GoPro. All right. Is it GoPro time? 
What's that? It is GoPro time. Is it? Yes. Okay. Good. Then we will wrap this up. So I don't want to get GoPro. Let's see. Where can we? You can write us at Pope at Undead Cow Films. Sorry, Undead Pope at UndeadCow dot com. You can find us on YouTube at Undead Cow Films. You can like us on Facebook. Do a search for Pope on Film. We'll come up there. Uh, of course, we are in the iTunes store. Please leave a, leave a nice review. We are on Stitcher. We are on Stitcher. Not sure what Stitcher is about yet. I'll get It's to a that website for surgeons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a website for surgeons and mad scientists called Stitcher. Oh, and for old, fat, white women who really like knitting. Yes. So join us next week where we will be doing Victory Through Air Power. A Disney animated movie. It's going to be crazy. <laughs> next week's going to be Disney week. We're going to be talking about classic Disney movies like Ed Wood. Mm-hmm. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams, and I am Reverend, and I am Reverend Steve. Don't lick a spark plug. We'll see you next week, America and other less great countries. I don't want to say that. I don't want. I don't want to get hate mail. (laughs) We'll see you next week. Infidels. (laughs) Infidels. <laughs> I kind of like that. I kind of like that. See you next it's week. Catchy. Infidels. Yeah, the spark plug thing isn't working out. I took a shot. See you next week, Infidels. That might be good. Yeah. Yeah. Good night and big balls. <laughs> Need to come up with a good end catchphrase. See you next week, gang. Well, maybe anybody listening can can pop a couple of suggestions on our Facebook page. How about that? Yes. Yes. Come up with suggestions yeah. on the Facebook page for our end line. Yeah. I've got a good I've got a good end line for this episode. He would have called it Murdered Man his greatest work. Yes. Twas beauty killed the beast. <laughs> he tampered in God's domain. Good night, everybody. Right. Good night. I gotta run.